All right, everyone. Um, it's 8.29, but uh, let's go ahead and get started. I am going to be recording or try to record every single lecture going forward. Not all the lectures in this section have a video attached to it. So I want to make sure that everyone has access to it, uh, even if they weren't able to make it. Remember, um, there is a correlation between attendance in class and performance on the test. I do actually walk you through a lot of the concepts, um, you know, pretty systematically. So uh, I would encourage you all to be able to, you know, come to class and um, take advantage of that. Uh, all right, so with that, I was able to get everyone's score um, except a few students who took it outside of class, um, and I do have a few students that still need to take it due to illness. So I can't give you the answers yet, but by Monday night, I should be able to open it up to everybody so that you can see the right answers, all right? Um, I do have some statistics for you, though. So um, here is kind of a breakdown of our class. Uh, you can actually see the Gaussian curve. Um, just so you know, as a professor, I actually shoot for 77 as an average, and you hit it right on the mark. It doesn't really matter whether you took Proctorio or the paper exam. Um, I usually get about 77 as the average, and so this semester is no different than any other semester. Um, all right, so you can take a look at that. The average time to take the school the test was 52 minutes. So I will allow, again, um, last time I opened it up at 8.20, uh, everyone had about an hour to finish, um, as, uh, as much as 80 minutes, okay? I'll do the same thing next time. Uh, the high score was I had two 100s, uh, so perfect scores, and then I had uh, the low score was 40%. So, um, so here's what I'll say. I know some of you um, didn't feel that uh, this was representative of how you've been doing in the class. Um, and I want to remind you that you can retake an exam. Okay, so if you did poorly on this exam, remember at the end of the semester, you can retake this exam. It's not going to be the exact one, uh, but it's going to be very similar. So if the question, was, you know, on this exam, it asked about conductance. What's the definition of conductance? On the makeup exam, it probably is going to be something like the definition of resistance. So each question is going to be very similar, but just a little bit different. Um, also, Proctorio. I was thrilled with Proctorio. It really helped um, with my grading. Obviously, I was able to grade the rest of the paper exams last night and give you your results right away. Um, I will encourage everyone for the next exam to take it through Proctorio. So please, if you haven't already, uh, I have the pre-exam one open until next week. If you're not familiar with Proctorio, I highly encourage you to try Proctorio and um, make sure that you're familiar with it. Again, I'm going to highly encourage everyone next time to take it through Proctorio. Any questions so far about the exam? <coughs> Uh, again, going forward, you know the format. It's about 40 questions every single time. Yes. That's what I was wondering. If it's 40 questions, say you get a point off, mm -hmm. do you, you'd have 39 out of 40. Do you, are you just scaling it up to 100 points, or are different questions weighted differently point-wise? Uh, different questions are weighted differently. Okay. So on Proctorio, you could probably see that. It'll say, like, right uh, after the question, it'll say two points or three points. Okay. So all the questions, except the matching, were only a half a point each. Um, but usually on Proctorio, you can actually see the point system. Okay. Unfortunately, on the paper copies, you weren't able to see that. But if you have any questions about that, you can always come in and talk to me uh, about that. Okay. Yeah, thank you for the question. <coughs> uh, yes, question in the very back, yes. yes. So when you say highly encourage next time to use Proctorio, yes. do you mean that there's no paper option? Okay, so I understand that if your computer is, I had a couple of computers that were overheating. And if you are really, really worried that you uh, won't have access to the exam, then I will make an exception. 
but I feel like I'm going, I had 35 people take the, the, the paper exam. And um, this time I felt like maybe it was because they hadn't really um, done Proctorio before. Uh, so I will make some accommodations. Don't worry about that. Don't be stressed about that. Um, but I also will highly encourage those that maybe just were a little bit unfamiliar with Proctorio and preferred the paper copy, I will encourage them to take the Proctorio exam, okay? All right. Okay, so that's uh, pretty much it for the first section, everyone. Um, just so you know, too, going forward, if the average is not at 77, let's just say for some reason it's at 74, I will give everyone three points to get to 77, and that's just a straight curve, okay? Uh, those that maybe had 100 would get three extra credit points. So I'm always targeting that 77 mark, and just just it just so happened this first exam you hit it right on the mark. Um, all right, so let's get started with today's lecture. We're going to start now with muscle and cardiovascular. Cardiovascular is one of my favorite sections. Love cardiovascular. I think that you'll really like it because it it takes a lot of the concepts that we have already been learning and applies it to the heart. Um, so don't purge everything that you know about action potentials. Uh, action potentials actually do propagate along muscle, whether we're talking about skeletal muscle or cardiac muscle. So I want to make sure that that isn't lost as we're going forward. All right, so still recording here. Let's start with the neuromuscular junction. There's only a couple of slides here, but I want information. Where we left off with the first section with cells and neurons, um, we left off talking about the action potentials propagating down the axons and arriving at the axon terminal end. And you learned that signal uh, transduction was the signals between the neuron and the muscle. Okay, so that's where we left off, but now we're gonna fill in some of the details here. All right, so the action potential propagates along the axon until it arrives at the axon terminal end. And that depolarization Right, that depolarization wave arrives at these voltage-gated calcium channels. Very important to realize that this is a calcium channel, a voltage-gated calcium channel. Now, which way is the calcium going to be moving? Well, it depends on the concentration gradient and the membrane potential. All right, and due to those two factors, in this case, calcium will be rushing into the cell. Calcium binds to a number of docking proteins. If you were taking cell biology, uh, they would fill all that in, synaptotagmin, synaptobrevin, all of those docking proteins. But for our purposes, you can just know that calcium binds to docking proteins. And that allows for vesicle fusion, right? Vesicle fusion at the plasma membrane. So calcium is really important in this response. In fact, it initiates this response, the increase in intracellular calcium. All right, so when the vesicle, which has all of this neurotransmitter, this is acetylcholine, when this vesicle fuses with the plasma membrane, acetylcholine is released into the synaptic cleft. You can actually see that's labeled right here, synaptic cleft. And acetylcholine binds to a ionotropic receptor. It's a receptor that is an ion channel called the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. I'll write that down for you. Get the document camera up and running here. All right. 
so this is an important concept only because it can be confusing. When we talk about the heart, we're going to talk about muscarinic acetylcholine receptors that are metabotropic. metabotropic. They're G-protein coupled. So I don't want you to get confused. I'm going to make this very clear. These ionotropic, oops, let's see here. Let me zoom in on this. Go so you can see it. Ionotropic, ionotropic receptors, and the actual receptor is called the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. It's a little blurry. There we go. All right, so sometimes it is um, abbreviated the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And again, they're ionotropic, meaning they are ion channels. So it's really important to know the name this time associated with these receptors. We're going to go into a lot more detail about that. So going back to our slide here. All right, so a uh, neurotransmitter is released. That's acetylcholine. It binds to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And... Um, you can take a look at this on your own time. It's really not that great. It just kind of shows you that these acetylcholine receptors bind, or these acetylcholine neurotransmitters bind to their receptor. All right, so let's go to, that's kind of end portion. Now what happens at the muscle? Yes, of course. Yeah, so the nicotinic, it's important to know the names because when we get to the heart, we're going to talk about the parasympathetic nervous system input on the heart, uh, and you need to know the muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. So to be able to uh, distinguish between the two because they have completely different functions, I needed to make sure that you knew exactly what those acetylcholine receptors were at, on the skeletal muscle. Does that make sense? Without that detail, it can be way too confusing. Okay? Yeah, if you want to, you're, you're, you still look confused. I'm so sorry. Did you have a question? I just don't, I don't, what is the difference? Or what do they do? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let me let that's that's what I was missing. Okay. So let's go back to that slide. All right. Okay. So here's the slide. Just to be clear, here is the neurotransmitter, these little triangles, and this is acetylcholine. Uh, this pink receptor right here, see it's actually just labeled receptor. These pink receptors are the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And those are ionotropic. They, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second, but that's how that relates to this, this diagram. Okay, awesome, yeah. Thank you for the clarification. I want to make sure that everyone understands that. And then again, there is an animation at the end if you want to take a look at that at home. All right, so now let's keep going with that. Um, all right, so what I'd like to do is give you an overview of the anatomy of the muscle first before we actually zero back in on that end plate, which is where those nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are, okay? So let me first give you kind of a big picture of the organization of a muscle. 
then we'll zero in again on that end plate where those nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are expressed. Okay, so uh, a few, um, you can see here, a few learning objectives, right, up front. So you can take a look at that when you get home. That's to help you with your studying. Um, let's start here. With any muscle, what we're going to be talking about is something known as the sliding filament mechanism. And whether we're talking about skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, or even smooth muscle, this is all about actin and myosin interactions. So myosin filaments bind to and move actin filaments. And that is the basis for the contraction, for the shortening of these stimulated muscles, whether we're talking about, again, skeletal, smooth, or cardiac. All right, all three types have these myosin-actin interactions. And I'm gonna tell you right now, the key to understanding this is all about calcium. So once calcium floods into the intracellular space, it promotes the binding of actin and myosin, which then stimulates contraction, allows for contraction. So it's all about calcium. So we're gonna learn that there are, there's an excitation part first, those action potentials are, are initiated, and then contraction occurs. This is called excitation contraction coupling. Excitation contraction coupling. So it's all about changes in the membrane potential of muscle. That happens first. Then that stimulates the release of calcium, which then causes contraction. So again, you'll see this over again. Don't worry, this is just an overview, an introduction of muscle. This is all called the sliding filament mechanism. So raise your hand high if you have any questions. All right, so we're going to be talking about the difference between skeletal, cardiac, and smooth muscles throughout. For those that are taking the lab, that's what your lab next week is gonna concentrate on. You're actually gonna look at cells in the microscope. Uh, you've already done the EMG, the electromyogram, uh, but you'll be concentrating more on uh, the differences between these cell types. Uh, what you'll notice right up front is with skeletal muscle, skeletal muscle is multinucleated. It's because these cells have fused into one large cell, okay? It's called syncytial cells, right? You don't need to know that, but just know that they're fused together to form one large cell that's multinucleated. You can also see with skeletal muscle, they look like stripes, like zebra, zebra stripes, these small stripes. This is what's known as striations. It's labeled right here, striations. Let me blow this up a little bit so you can actually maybe see it. Okay. So here's the striations. They're multinucleated. And we'll talk more about skeletal muscle in just a second. All right. So cardiac muscle is the next one. You can't see it as well, but these are also striated. You can see here's the label striations and they're not as noticeable, but they are made up of striations. Striations are basically sarcomeres. That's the unit of contraction within muscle. So these striated muscles are organized in something called sarcomeres, the single unit of contraction in muscle. And I'll have some formal definitions for you all in just a minute. We'll review it again. And I'll give you some, I'll roll out that formal definition. Smooth muscle is not striated. It's not organized in sarcomeres. But uh, actin and myosin is still responsible for the contraction of smooth muscle. 
leptin and myosin, even though it's not organized the same way. All right, so contractile cells like this muscle are very unique to animals and they're made of what's called myocytes. All right, myocytes is another name for uh, muscle fiber. Okay, so I'm gonna write this down for you. I think this is important because I know this is a source of confusion. So when we say myocytes, myocytes, that is the same as muscle fiber, which are both the muscle cell itself. A myocyte and a muscle fiber are one muscle cell. This is not equal to a myofibril. What we'll learn is the myofibril is an organelle within the muscle cell. So I can guarantee this is a test question. It seems easy, but it is a huge source of confusion. If I ask you what the muscle cell is also called, please note that it is the muscle fiber, not the myofibril. So again, these, you know, these terms can be very confusing. These, these are some things that you have to put to memory. Later on in this lecture, you'll see that it's all written out for you, so you don't, I just am trying to make sure that you know the terminology up front as we go through it. All right, again, two main types. We've already talked about this. Striated includes skeletal and cardiac, but uh, it does not include smooth. Smooth is not striated. And there's two main types of control. Voluntary, this is through the somatic nervous system and those somatic uh, motor neurons. And involuntary, through the autonomic system. And that includes the sympathetic and parasympathetic. All right, just some overview. Uh, another term that I really need you to know is a single motor unit. What is a motor unit? Let's take a look at this first diagram here. A motor unit is a single motor neuron and all of the muscle fibers that it innervates. You can see it's in contact with one, two, three, four, five muscle fibers. This whole thing is considered a single motor unit. So you can see here at the bottom, colors should be, I think, a little bit more distinct but this is two motor units. This pink neuron is innervating one, two, three, four muscle fibers. And this orange one is innervating one, two, three muscle fibers. This is considered two motor units. So again, a single motor unit consists of a motor neuron and all of the muscle fiber fibers it controls. So, Let's zoom out, let's take a look at whole muscle and how that's organized. This is a frog gastronemius muscle. That's the calf muscle of a frog. In my day, we actually used to hang uh, frog muscle. Boy, I couldn't do that today. I'd cry, you guys would be crying. It would be really tough. It would be an ugly day. We'd be, all be ugly crying. Um, yeah, so what we would have to do is isolate this gastronemius muscle. And uh, you can actually see here, if you do a cross section of it, it's made up of bundles of fiber. Let's blow this up a little bit so you can see it better. All right, so you do a cross section of the whole muscle. It's made up of bundles of fiber and then each of these um, structures within the bundle is a cell. This is the muscle fiber itself. So again, remember muscle fiber is the myocyte or muscle cell. Now you'll also notice the connective tissue that surrounds each of the bundles. This is called fascia. And anybody heard of like fasciitis? plantar's fasciitis, that's, that's an inflammation. Anytime you have itis at the end, it's an inflammation. 
So this is inflammation of that connective tissue that causes a lot of pain in people's feet. All right, so now what I'd like to do is blow up this square right here. Let's take a look at the muscle fiber itself. Remember, this is just one cell. So we're gonna blow that up. This is what we have. Now within the cell, this whole thing represents a muscle cell, a muscle fiber. You can see the nucleus. Remember in skeletal muscle, it's multinucleated. And other organelles like mitochondria, you can see here's another mitochondria down here. And then you'll notice right away these large uh, structures, cylinders, these are the myofibrils, okay, the myofibrils. And what you're looking at is the red is the myosin and the green is the actin. And so these are the contractile units, right? The myosin is a molecular motor and it uses ATP to walk along the actin, shortening the muscle causing contraction. So again, the myofibrils are not the muscle cell. They're an organelle within the muscle cell called myofibrils. All right, also what we'll talk about is the end plate. The end plate is on the plasma membrane, okay? The cell membrane, when we're specifically talking about muscle, is called the sarcolemma. That is the cell membrane, the plasma membrane of a muscle cell. And we'll learn about graded potentials within the end plate and action potentials again. Action potentials propagate along the cell membrane, down the T-tubules, right? These T-tubules are called transverse tubules. Don't worry, we'll, we'll go through this again in more detail. Action potentials dive into the interior of the muscle, and this whole orange lattice structure is called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It's analogous to the endoplasmic reticulum in epithelial cells. It's that structure, the SR, is this entire orange-looking ladder, lattice-looking structure. And that's where all the calcium is in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So when that action potential goes down the T-tubule, it, there's several different steps. At the end, it releases calcium into the intracellular space, which allows for actin and myosin to interact and cause contraction. Don't feel you have to get all of this down today. I'm just giving you an overview of how muscle works and we'll dive into the details next week. All right, the terminal cisterni of the SR is just the area of the sarcoplasmic reticulum that is next to the T-tubule. And in, say, birds like hummingbirds, hummingbirds that really need to uh, use their muscle. Have you ever seen the wings of hum hummingbirds? They are so fast, sometimes you don't see the wings moving up and down. Um, and because of the nature of that contraction, their terminal cisterni is very uh, extensive, very well organized to help with that uh, uh, movement, that quick, fast movement. All right, so some formal definitions. Transverse tubules are the T-tubules. They are sarcolemmal, remember that's the plasma membrane of muscle, invaginations, which means that the, the sarcolemma actually dives deep into the muscle, the interior of the muscle, to make sure the action potentials can penetrate. They enhance action potential penetration and are more developed in larger, faster twitching muscle. Sarcoplasmic reticulum has all of the calcium and the terminal cisterni, when it's well developed, increases that storage. So, summary slide, the defining characteristics, multinucleated. 
We'll learn a little bit more about fast twitch, slow twitch muscle. Uh, it's actually the slow twitch muscle that have a lot of mitochondria. Fast twitch don't. We'll learn more about that later. Uh, it has T-tubules. It has myofibrils, and it's organized in sarcomeres. And some important terms, sarcolemma is the plasma membrane of muscle. I didn't mention this yet, sarcoplasm is the cytoplasm of muscle. And the sarcoplasmic reticulum, again, is analogous to the smooth ER. All right, so a little overview. Let's zero in on the motor end plate now. This is where we left off. We talked about the neuron. Now we're going to talk about what happens at what's called the motor end plate. So you can see that there is this valley, this divot right here, where the neuron actually interacts with the muscle. And this area right here, all in kind of light green, is called the motor end plate. The motor end plate. This is where all the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are. Okay, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So there's release of the acetylcholine into the synaptic clef. Then it binds to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. These ionic tropic receptors are non-selective cation channels. Non-selective cation channels. So I'm going to bring you back to the last section, right? So here we go. Um, these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors whoops, are ionotropic. And I'm going to elaborate on that a little bit. They are non-selective cation channels. So if this is the end plate, right? That's the end plate. These receptors, they conduct sodium and potassium pretty much equally. So if sodium is going in and potassium is going out, how is it that you can depolarize the cell? It seems like it's an electroneutral event. But I want you to think about the cord conductance equation one more time here. Why don't you talk to your neighbors, maybe even write on the board, tell me how is this possible that it still depolarizes the muscle at the end plate? How is that possible? relative conductances have to be. <laughs> All right, so let's just say the equilibrium potential for potassium is like minus 84. Equilibrium potential for sodium, let's just say plus 84. What would you say is happening? Anybody want to take a stab at it? What do you think? How is it still depolarizing the cell? What would you say if 
the conductance is actually when these channels open, they're more like 50-50. Where's the actual membrane voltage going to go? Did we forget everything already? <laughs> zero, right? It's going to go, it'll still depolarize. It'll just go to zero, right? It'll still depolarize. It'll go to zero, right? Here's the resting membrane, all right? So it is still enough to depolarize the cell, right? It's more now, 50% of the conductance is due to sodium, 50% is due to potassium. So it depolarizes the cell, no doubt about it, at the end plate, and everything you know about graded potentials is happening at the end plate, right? All of these receptors, they're being stimulated, there's depolarization. You actually don't even need summation it is enough of a depolarization event, these waves, to trigger voltage-gated sodium channels right here at the sarcolemma, outside of the motor end plate. So you get action potentials that now propagate along the sarcolemma, I've cut it off, and down the T-tubules. So, at the end plate, remember these are graded potentials. It's enough of a depolarization that it will trigger action potentials outside of the end plate that will propagate along the sarcolemma and down the T tubules. All right, so everything you know about graded potentials and action potentials actually apply to muscle. Very important. All right, nice job so far. All right, so I like to kind of show this particular slide um, only because this will help you with any kind of application type problem. What I mean by that is if I say, if there is a uh, drug that I've used to, um, let's go to this bottom one that happens to be an antagonist, a blocker, of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, how is that going to affect action potentials? How is that going to affect muscle contraction? So let's just walk through some of these possible drug effects on synaptic effectiveness. You can manipulate this response by, here's A, right? You can release there can be a release and degradation of the neurotransmitter inside the axon terminal. Obviously, a drug like that wouldn't allow for the release of acetylcholine and the activation of those nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, so it would block muscle contraction. You could maybe increase, there could be increased neurotransmitter release into the synapse. Now, one thing with skeletal muscle is that it is an all or none event. So it won't cause a further contraction, but it may cause contraction for a longer period of time. So you can increase neurotransmitter release here into the synapse. C is the prevention of neurotransmitter release into the synapse. Let me give you an example of that. Um, all right, so essentially there is a toxin called clostridium, okay? It's, a, it's basically a bacteria that releases a toxin that prevents calcium from binding to this docking protein and it prevents the release of acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. Clostridium, I'm not going to give you the species name. Anyone want to guess what that could be? Botox. It is Botox. Some people have already heard, right? This is Clostridium botulinum. It's called, the toxin is called Botox. That's how it works. Botox inhibits the release of acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. When you, when you inject it into your forehead, it causes muscle re relaxation so you don't get as many wrinkles, right? 
that doesn't sound fun to me. I think that seems pretty risky, but people do it all the time. But that's what's happening. That's what Botox does. It inhibits calcium from binding to those docking proteins so you don't get release of those neurotransmitters. All right, D, inhibition of synthesis of the neurotransmitter. Again, that would block any kind of muscle contraction. Now, this is interesting. E is a reduced uptake of the neurotransmitter from the synapse. So what that means is if you reduce the uptake of your neurotransmitter, then the neurotransmitter sticks around, stays around in the synaptic cleft longer, which can prolong your response, prolong the contraction or with other neurons. Uh, you've probably heard of um, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs. Those are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. A lot of times they're used for uh, depression, right? It it's allows for the neurotransmitter to stick around in the synaptic cleft longer to prolong any kind of response. Uh, a reduced degradation of the neurotransmitters, these are the acetylcholine esterase inhibitors. That allows for acetylcholine to stay in the synaptic cleft longer. Or MAOIs, also used to treat depression, monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Again, allows for the neurotransmitter to stay around longer. Now, the last one, either an agonist or an antagonist. You can imagine one of the agonists for the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor is nicotine. One of the antagonists are curare, right? These are, um, have you ever heard of those poison darts that indigenous uh, people in South America use to paralyze their prey, right? That is an antagonist to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. It actually paralyzes prey, right? So those are blockers. Now, let me show you something quickly here. Um, here's your homework assignment. It's not due until next Friday. I didn't print it out. I'm trying to save paper this semester. Uh, but it is actually on your website. Let's go to your website here. If you go to the website, and again, you know how to find your assignments. If you go down to the course summary, you can actually find our tired swimmer case. It's case number four. And I will let you read about it. We'll talk more, a little bit more about it on Monday. And here it is right here. Tired Swimmer, when you download it, it's a case of a woman who actually is swimming and becomes uh, very fatigued by her exercise. So I'll let you read about that and what myasthenia gravis is all about. So do have a top hat question. Here's, well, here's actually some uh, just review. The release of acetylcholine from the motor neuron causes what's known as end plate potentials, EPPs, end plate potentials. These are graded potentials. Remember, those end plate potentials are graded potentials. Acetylcholine esterase is the enzyme that actually is within the synaptic cleft, and that enzyme breaks down acetylcholine. That's what's responsible actually for repolarization. When this enzyme starts to really start to break down acetylcholine, that repolarizes the motor end plate, brings it back down, it hyperpolarizes the, uh, the cell back to its resting value. And it's interesting that submation is not required to trigger an action potential outside the end plate. I mentioned that before. Submation is not required. All right, uh, get out your top hat. I have one top hat question today. Make sure that everybody gets a chance to answer. All right, today's top hat question is fairly easy. For those that have been in class. All right. 
an end plate potential elicited at the neuromuscular junction and propagated along the end plate, so you're still within the end plate, is that A, an action potential that's propagated along the sarcolemma and down the T-tubules? I'm going to just make sure that you realize this is within the end plate. B, an action potential initiated by the opening of voltage-gated calcium channels. C, a graded potential generated by the activation of muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. Or D, a graded potential initiated by the opening of a non-selective cation channel, which is equally permeable to both sodium and potassium. And if you guys want to, you can talk to your neighbors today. <laughs> I just want to make sure that everyone understands these concepts. Oh, my computer just died. Oh, no worries. Um, I'm trying to do it on my phone. Um, just, just write it down. Yeah. I know you're here. So these are the types of questions that, you know, can be confusing. They can be confusing, but if you know the terminology and the concept, then it's pretty straightforward. Does anyone in this room need more time? Try to peek around these columns. Anybody need more time? All right, thank you, yes. <laughs> yes, 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 all right. So what do we have here? I'm gonna go ahead and close this one. And the correct response is D. Let's see, yes. Nice job, 89% of you got that right. Sweet, all right, nice job. All right, so we're not gonna do the, the uh, we'll do the next one next time. All right, so um, we only have a few minutes left, but I wanna just roll out something. Uh, we'll be talking next time about excitation contraction coupling. You can see here the excitation part happens first. This is a typical action potential that's gonna propagate down the T-tubules, right? And there's a latent period or a lag time, and then you can start to measure muscle fiber tension, which is force that can be measured by a contraction. All right. Anybody notice something interesting about the action potentials in muscles? What's different about it that you notice that is different than action potentials in neurons? There's no undershoot. Right, that's right, there's no undershoot. Um, this is just some, a fun fact. Uh, the repolarization event is actually due to not only potassium, like it is in neurons, but also chloride. And there are animals that don't have that chloride channel. And when that happens, let me just show you. The last couple minutes here, let me just show you. These animals are a known, they have a known defect, have no, have no. So if I go back to, I'm gonna go to, have you all seen these animals before? Fainting goats? Yeah. So far, so far where we've where been, we've trying, been to trying to get eat, everything, everything is, is salad, salad hot, dogs, hot dogs, and back at home, home, we don't need we that, don't kind, of that kind of stuff. We eat a we lot, eat of, a lot goat of goat meat, meat and, we've been, and we've been missing it, missing it. a lot. A lot. <laughs> Then Jimmy, then Jimmy said, said what do you guys, you guys say something? something? There's a, there's a goat from, from just down the, just road. Down the road. Hello. 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 Hi. Hi. 
Rick. I'm Rick. I'm Rick. Hello, 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 Lamont. 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 Glad, Lamont. To glad to meet you. Glad to meet you. Nancy. Nancy. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. You guys are you guys a long, are long, long way from home. Yeah. 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 We're going to buy, we're gonna buy a goat. We have a lot, have of, goats. A lot of goats. <laughs> These goats, These goats are from six, from six, two, seven, two, seven two, months old. What's happening to them? Come on, girl. Come on, girl. Let's get up. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. What did he do? What did he do? Here, here. All right, a nice visual. Just so you know, the goats can't repolarize, so, so they have this persistent contractile event, this contraction. They're waiting literally for the pump to repolarize the cell, to push potassium back in, to be able to, they just come out of it, out of it after a few minutes but it's because of that missing chloride channel, yes. And that's why there's no undershoot. That's why there's no undershoot. Yes, question. Uh, extra credit was already, but you can turn it in any time. Are you talking about the extra credit for uh, the length constant? Yeah, just go ahead and turn it in now. It's fine. Yes, yeah. Um, I put the answers up already, if you guys haven't noticed. And for those of you that did turn in the uh, extra credit, your graded sheets are back here if you want to pick it up. Yes. Yes, yes, that sounds good. Hey. Uh, yeah, that's fine. I can't wait, like, make, I guess make up a little more. That sounds great.